all so much for joining us this afternoon, this evening. This is our first happy hour format, so I hope you all have an adult juice box or a glass of wine or champagne or iced tea or coffee or whatever you'd like, but uh, this is going to be a really fun dialogue today. I'm Crystal Boyer. I'm the president and CEO of the National Children's Museum. They call me Dreamer in Chief, um, which I think uh, is pretty accurate. I'm always the optimistic dreamer here at the National Children's Museum. Uh, I, I am so excited about the dialogue we're going to have today. So this roundtable series at the National Children's Museum has been something we started back in 2021 as a way to really engage leading experts like we have here today on various topics that affect children and families. And so what's more important than play for children and families and really for the work that we're doing here today? So this is gonna be a really fun conversation. Um, just a couple of housekeeping pieces. If you'd like a program, there's a QR code um, on the table and you've already found, I see many of you, the Legos. We always have Legos on the table at the National Children's Museum. Legos, magnetiles, um, what are those little blocks called that we keep to, um, which one? Circuit blocks. We have circuit blocks, anything we can play with. So please build, have fun. Um, and there's also assignments here to see if you can build the things delegated to your table. We will have a competition. We are always competing. Um, so feel free to fidget. Um, our mission at the National Children's Museum is to inspire children to care about and change the world. We do that by fostering innovation, curiosity, creativity, and we really do that through STEAM education. So we're doing that with science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and everything we do. The Bureau of Labor and Statistics has told us that in 2021, there were nearly 10 million workers in STEM occupations. And this total is projected to grow by almost 11% by 2031. I see our friend from Boeing shaking his head. So I know this is something we are all thinking about, um, but that application of STEAM, and particularly the addition of the A, the art element, is really um, how we feel like we can reach more women, a more diverse population in these core concepts. So um, play is the through line for us here at the National Children's Museum. It's the vehicle we use to deliver content and develop skills in an active, meaningful, and enjoyable way. And that's what we're here to talk about today with the help of these amazing panelists. So I want to thank Roberta Golenkoff from the University of Delaware, Michelle Lee, who is a partner and managing director at IDEO's Play Lab, and Jean Margaret Smith, the senior vice president of public affairs and administration at Nickelodeon, for being here today for this conversation. So to understand the power of play and understanding the science of learning, it seems like a natural place to start. So Roberta. We're going to start with you, if that's OK. okay. You've dedicated. When you finish building something and you're proud, you can shout out like a child, look at what I did. <laughs> it won't be a problem. We're all children, former children, is what we say. Yes. Um, you've dedicated your career to researching how children develop and learn. Let's imagine for a second that it's the first day of classes at the University of Delaware, and you're teaching an introductory course on the science of learning. What are the highlights you would tease on that very first day to explain how children learn? So if I might give you a more specific example, I'm teaching language acquisition this semester, which of course is a part of the science of learning. And one of the things I felt I needed to do was to convince the people in the classroom who'd never thought about this why we need language. So I pass out big index cards, and on each of the index cards, I write something that they have to show without using language, and they cannot use charades. They cannot do sounds like, right? What two-year-old does this, right? <laughs> so one is, um, there's a man who just pulled into the driveway, and you don't know who he is. Can you imagine trying to convey this to your parent without language, right? So we get a lot of laughs for these things. We give, I give them different scenarios. And it leads to a great appreciation, because we all have language now. So we all think, oh, it's so obvious, right? It's not obvious until you act like a kid. And you see how difficult it is to get things across. And I try to do these kinds of demonstrations whenever I have an opportunity in the class, because it means so much more than just reading the material, period. So it's all about 
playful, active learning if you want to make a difference for people in classrooms at any level, in my view. At any level, I think that's very important. I think even you know, as an administrator, as someone who's you know, running a meeting, obviously we all think about these things. Um, so what role does play have in how children learn? Obviously you're talking about um, you know, this being the, the vehicle by which kids are able to express themselves. Do you feel like, um, is there any other role that you would say play has in how children learn? Express yourself, learn along the way, grow. It, it, there's so many things that happen during play that I will run out of fingers to illustrate them. <laughs> when did you figure out what you wanted to be when you grew up? I will bet you that some of you played at what you wanted to be. Anybody want to share what they played at when they were a kid and they did something similar when they grew up? Go ahead. I played at being a teacher. She played at being a teacher. Okay, somebody else? What did you play at? Me? Yeah. I'm still figuring it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so play, go ahead. I played at being a chef. And are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. That's great. So, but it is often the case that how you play is who you become. Not always, right, Jeff? And uh, you figure out what you like, what you don't like, who you are. You are in charge with play. No one tells you what to do. It's when you cultivate your sense of agency. It's when you learn about the world around you. And for free play, it's when you get in trouble. Right? Because if there aren't parents around watching you, you'll do what I did when I was in the second grade, and I went up to the top floor of my six-story apartment building to check out the roof. My mother heard about that from a neighbor. So, but this is the kind of thing you learn. You learn what are acceptable risks that you can take, right? You learn how to use your body. Motor development is all about what you do during play. You learn how to get along with people. You learn how to negotiate. Growing up in New York, there was a phrase, gates are closed. Anybody hear that? <laughs> I grew up in Brooklyn. Can you tell? <laughs> so uh, if you came along a group that was already at play, they would say, gates are closed. That meant you couldn't join. So you had to figure out how to come up with something that would allow you to get in with the group. This is when we, this is the first opportunity for negotiation. It continues throughout life, whether you're married or not, right? And you have to learn how to do this fairly, right? This is all part of what happens when you play. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> I love it. So obviously play is serious work, and if play is the work of young children, then toys would be one of their tools. So the National Association of, for the Education of Young Children found that children who played with educational toys had higher levels of creativity, problem-solving skills, and social skills. One of the many functions of IDEO's Play Lab is to invent toys. And Michelle is the leader of the Play Lab, which I have followed and fangirled about for many, many years. Um, can you speak to how principles of play and learning inform and inspire your team's design process for toys, but also for services and experiences? How does it manifest in that final product? Sure, yeah. So uh, we love uh, reading about the research of play and what is coming out of academia and science. But we um, at IDEO, I think, approach it from more of a practitioner point of view. So when we are studying learning and play, it's in service of making a toy or another product or some kind of service. And we are constantly going out and learning from kids. We do um, qualitative research. Like the rest of IDEO, it's all human-centered. So it's not about the designer sitting at their desk and having this flash of brilliance. It's more about how do we get into the world and learn from the people we're designing for. And with toys, it's children. Um, so it's very fun. Uh, it's about going and having kids lead the way, showing us their room and pointing out 
what is really meaningful to them as well as what would they give away right away if they had to clean their room. Um, it's also about getting on the floor and having them walk through the games with us. And I think the biggest compliment that we know that we did it right is when we leave and the kid asks if we can come back for another play date. Um, <laughs> because it's a lot of fun and it's about showing versus telling and kids are experts at that. Um, it's also about the co-design process and having them work with us to develop products even further. And so we watch to see what kids are naturally doing and we're, when we're designing toys and games, it's about getting out of the way uh, and not making it harder to play, but really facilitating their imaginations, giving them the prompts and the ways to jump off and try something new and different. So, for instance, we see kids who are playing with cars and they might be running against the surface and when it gets to the edge, either it crashes really dramatically or it takes off and starts to fly in magical ways. So we made a car that can roll on the surface and then when it gets to the edge, you flip it and these wings come out and it flies. And so it just helps feed that imagination, lets them see what they do with it. Um, Another example, still on the plain um, train of uh, thought, uh, we noticed that young preschoolers have a really hard time with remote control vehicles because it's not intuitive to use an RC controller. That's something that an adult dreamed up. So when we did a dusty wing control RC toy, we looked at how kids naturally play, uh, role play as airplanes. And the way they do it is they hold their hands out and they tip side by side and they run around the room. So the remote control we made was putting a tilt sensor within these wingtips so kids could hold them out and then they run around the room and then Dusty, who's afraid of flights, runs around the ground and banks left and right and turns according to what the kid's doing. So that's where we draw inspiration. We're constantly looking to the kids as experts of play and then drawing that into our work. Um, and yes, as we do that for toys, but we believe that all of us need to play and we think that play is a mindset and a way of approaching our work so we bring that to our work across all different industries. Um, we've made a magic school bus in, with our education team, which is really about helping kids role play as scientists and engineers so they can see themselves in those roles and really aspire to them in the future. Uh, we've done this in the world of climate and sustainability in terms of just approaching that with a more positive, optimistic mindset and the idea that we can challenge assumptions and imagine and then make a different world. That's amazing. Go ahead, Roberta. So I love everything you just said, and I want one of those. <laughs> That's so cool. But it's very I, fun. I have to quibble just a little bit with the idea of educational toys. When I talk about educational toys, not that you guys do this, mm -hmm. you don't. I always put it in quotes. Why? <laughs> because a lot of toys that we consider to be educational, looking for one right answer, and they a lot of the stuff that you have on kids' tablets have advertisements. And in a way, they are the enemy of children's museums because children's museums give you the opportunity to use your bodies to learn about the world. And you don't do that when you're on a tablet. So I think the, the apps are getting better, but in general, there are still far too many apps that lull children into passivity. And that's not how kids learn best, not like the stuff they make. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I recall you said educational toys, um, and uh, we're a bunch of designers and engineers at IDEO. If you ask anyone, we actually have to put a rule that says, um, when we do an icebreaker that asks, what's your favorite toy, we have to say, don't say Lego, because otherwise everyone will say that, because Lego is a great example of what I consider an educational toy, but it unlocks imagination, gives you a tool to bring your imagination to life in a physical sure. way. So I think of educational very broadly yes. um, in terms of role play and constructive play um, and ways to activate imaginations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. My mother's been a math teacher for my entire life, and she does not like the new Legos, she calls it, where you have directions, right? Describe. So yes, so um, all of her grandkids get the, the briefcase with the Lego toys and you better just come up with something cool right. to show grandma on your own without directions because the imagination piece is what, what she thinks as a math teacher is not missing. So I hear you on that. Um, have her be on a panel, I like her. <laughs> <laughs> she would love to, she could talk all day about this. Um, so we know children can acquire new knowledge and skills through play and thoughtfully designed toys and experiences can be useful toys in that process. But we think here at the museum that the social health, the mental health, the things that they can do 
with their bodies at the museum are, are critically important, important. We have a kid advisory group, for example, that we bring together to advise on the development of our exhibits. My own son calls himself our chief beta tester, oh. um, you know, which is not a paid gig, um, but that is his self-appointed title. In 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health. And research suggests that the link between a lack of play and the increased level of depressions and anxiety in young people is there, it exists. Um, so we wanna have that physical play. We want kids to move their bodies in the museum. So Jean Margaret, I know you've spearheaded Nickelodeon's Worldwide Day of Play initiative for over a decade, which encourages children and their families to get up and get out and play together. We can share more about this initiative and the can you share more about this idea and this initiative? Sure. Um, it's actually been almost since the turn of the century that Nickelodeon decided to really take a deep dive on what play means and to sort of put it front and center to kids um, and talk with kids about it in, as a way of having a serious conversation in a sense. Um, you know, at that time, it was really, we were looking at, you know, Nickelodeon was formed 40 years ago, and, and the whole construct is that it, it needed to be about kids, it, it, that the worldview should be kid-centered, and that Nickelodeon should be kid-centered. So not only does that mean, you know, we've got fun, we've got play, um, we've got... Um, you know, appealing characters and all of that, but it also means that we have great power and great responsibility. And at the turn of the century, I, we started to do some more in-depth research, and, and what we were starting to find was kids and families reporting this sort of lack of play or this, like, concern about the ability to play safely or that adults were ruining uh, youth ho hockey games. So this has been going on a long time. I mean, this is stuff that's very familiar to all of us now. And you know, we just decided, OK, well, let's just take it to kids. And let's remind kids that it's OK to play. And so our messaging was like, you know, instead of you know, adults saying, you know, cut it out, stop playing around. It was more like, yeah, it's, it's our turn. It's our turn to play, and we need to play. So Worldwide Day of Play was begun as a way to ally ourselves with organizations that could help us sort of um, deliver on the media message that we were putting out as an entertainment company so that we could work in partnership with local organizations who, and parent groups, um, educational organizations, youth organizations, to, to, to really celebrate play. So we, every year, Worldwide Day of Play was a day that we shut the network down, and we went out into the communities, and we would host events. Um, sometimes there were big production events. We took over the mall one year in 2011. Um, with uh, Let's Move and Michelle Obama. Um, but it was, every year, it was really an important time to really focus on, okay, everybody's back to school, and September's such a big drive to do it, do it, do it, do it, you do your homework, do your homework. No, the, September is a time to take, it's, it's back to play. And so Worldwide Day of Play, we're just thrilled that, um, you know, during the, um, the pandemic, we transitioned a bit. Um, a, a lot of our programming was about incorporating Worldwide Day of Play every day, but we sort of said play every day kind of thing. Um, and we haven't been able to be in communities in such a big way anymore. But we were so thrilled when the Association of Children's Museums um, came to us and said, you want to play this September? And so this coming Saturday, September 30th, we will be playing with what, how many museums? What, Gabby just said 185 museums around the country. All over the world. Around the world, not on all continents, but on a lot of them. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I, th I, I think it's, 
it's, it, it's exuberant, it's exciting, um, it's really energized us back at Nickelodeon because getting back out there in this day and age, because what, we are, what our research now is telling us, that there's sort of a crisis of confidence. Kids believe that they cannot influence what is happening, not only in their world, so there's climate change is a big issue, divisiveness is a big issue, but they feel like they can't influence what's happening in their own lives. And that, that marker, we need to do more research, and I want to get more research about it, but that marker, it's like it's happening at a younger and younger age where they lose that confidence. So how do you get confidence? You learn new skills, you have new experiences, you play, you do what you were born to do. And, um, and in doing that, you gain the experience, you gain the confidence, then to go out and do more. So that's what we're working on now, and we have a new initiative called Our World. So Worldwide Day of Play is sort of our first inaugural Our World in Community event, thanks to the Association of Children's Museums. That's wonderful. We are so excited to celebrate this Saturday. We get to celebrate with the Paw Patrol. That's right. So we are going to be a very big hit on the Worldwide Day of Play. Thanks to Nickelodeon. Thank you for that. Um, so we've established that play is truly beneficial and essential in children's learning, right? We know that. Um, our marketing team was like, we're really tired of the reviews that say that this is just a play space. We want to be like, yes, it is. Thank you so much, you know? And so um, we've been talking about this for a while. Like, we need to really do it just like a campaign about the importance of play and how we do this. Um, we know that the time children are playing together or playing at all has been on the decline in the U.S. over the last 50 years. My team gave me the statistic that on average in the last 50 years, children are playing eight hours less per week. I don't know where this research came from. This might be research that you participated in at one point, but I think that's a, a staggering number. And I wonder, um, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of reasons, but yeah. do these stats reflect a decline of play at home, Roberta? Is it at school? Is it everywhere? So we have to think about the fact that kids only spend 20% of their waking lives at school. 80% is spent outside of school. And it's really important to nurture kids' play, both in school and out of school. And why did it decline? F-E-A-R. When the economy took a downturn, people thought, oh my God, my child has to go to Harvard, Yale, I have to prepare them. They're gonna have to study, study, study so that they can get into the best schools and play went away. It became just play. Now COVID has come along and that really showed how important just plain old ordinary play is for kids. And I'm hoping that post-COVID, and I'm even hoping we're post-COVID, it's back, go get vaccinated. Me too. <laughs> I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that uh, children will get out more. Now, there are a lot of places in the country where it's difficult for children to get out because it's not so safe. Hope we can fix that. Hope we can put in more community centers where it's safe for kids to go, including children's museums. We have to get kids out there playing. Why do we have a mental health crisis? Part of it is because they were locked at home with their parents. The parents have a mental health crisis too. Everybody, right? How many, how many people think parents and adults have to play more? Okay, we have to figure out ways to walk away from that computer. I just had to talk about this with Arthur. When I went on vacations in the past, no one could reach me. It was before email. I loved it. I read novels, right? Now, I take the computer, I'm a slave. I don't read novels anymore. We have to learn how to turn off. Americans work more than people in any Western society. It is not healthy for us, and we don't, provide role models for our kids. We make it look like if you're not working 24 seven, you're not doing your job. We have to learn how to turn off the phone during dinner, to put it away, not to take phone calls. We have to learn these things to be role models for our children. Children 
and adults need to play. When they call the shots, when they are the agents of their own fun. And fun comes in strange ways for kids. I mean, if they find packets of uh, ketchup and uh, mustard in your drawers, they may think it's great fun to build with them, right? We don't have to spend thousands of dollars on electronic toys. They have fun with everyday objects, and we should be encouraging that. No, I, I, I love that. I think that um, we talk about like there being a misconception between the correlation between play and learning for people, and that that's a you know a real issue. But I think this is a perfect segue to the question I wanted to ask Michelle about the work that you're doing to really sort of reinvent the workplace too, and the integration of toys and play and creativity and innovation. Yeah, um, so I'm listening to everything up here. I was like, yes, and also for adults. <laughs> I think it took me a little while. I mean, my background is I started in engineering. I worked in aerospace. Then I was like, oh, I want to do something more fun. Then I went and made toys. And I was like, oh, now I should be an adult. And so then I went and did design work and started not in the toy invention side of IDEO, but in the, just the general consulting side. And over time, I realized, actually, play needs to go beyond toys and kids, that adults need it just as much as kids do. I mean, play is a way that kids make sense of a world that they're just coming into and that they don't understand to conquer fear mm -hmm. and to figure out how to have agency mm -hmm. to go on and take on really big challenges. And that doesn't go away when we're adults. We have more and more challenges, and they're really, really hard. And knowing that play served us really well as kids it doesn't really make sense that we shun it as adults and we don't give ourselves permissions to play. And so um, I'm all about how do we bring more play into our work. And I think there's different ways we can do that. Um, one is um, how do we make it possible for people to play? What's that permission to play? We also can look at our processes and how do we bring play into the way we approach our challenges in our work. And another is like, how do we create spaces that give us permission to play? So when we look at people, um, I often talk about play in terms of um, psychological safety. You have to feel like you're safe, you can be vulnerable, you can be yourself, you can show up as your full self and bring in many different talents into your work. Um, I love to say that I have some of the best interaction designers and design researchers and business designers on my team. But I also take equal pride in saying that I have an improv artist, a magician, and an opera singer on my team. And they show up and they bring that to their work and it makes their work better. And if they hid that, their work would not be nearly as good as it is today. Um, the other piece is agency. So that confidence to show up and know that you can change the game, that what you do and what you contribute will actually affect the outcome. And that's acknowledging when someone brings something that's different and giving them um, um, the kudos, uh, also like helping them understand when they do something that maybe affected it in a, a way that wasn't as beneficial. Like, what does that mean, and what does that become? How does that become a learning experience? Um, and then joy is the third component when I think about people and how do you create the right environment for people, for people to thrive? Because um, joy is what keeps work going. You're not going to stay at what you're doing if it's not joyful and fun. Um, and fun is not always the way you picture it, where it's like rah rah um, the parties. I associate a lot with. Um, Chick sent me high and how he talks about flow. Like yes. how do you balance skill level with the challenges you're facing so that you're constantly growing and pushing yourself to expand and that puts you else in this really great sense of play. Um, and some of that's very focused play, not always laughing and loud play, but that's also play. Um, when it comes to approach, play is about approaching things with curiosity, asking questions, and this is really important when there's complex challenges out there, because we don't know all the pieces, and you can't put the puzzle together if you don't start asking questions and understanding what all the different parts are. And to answer those questions, you probably have to bring your friends in, so how do you also engage other stakeholders and come together? Play is really great at uniting people and also leveling the playing field so people come in equally. Um, and then um, it's also about experimentation. Play. Kids don't like sit around and strategize the whole time. They don't get an analysis paralysis. They actually try things. They start building from the start. And they know that they might not get it right at the beginning. But by just trying something, you're making progress and you learn. And you de-risk so that when you launch that thing at the end, you have more confidence in it and you understand why it should work. Um, and then the last piece is how do you create the right environment? And uh, if anyone is ever in San Francisco, please come by and visit us at IDEO at the Play Lab. 
because um, if you can picture it, it's concrete floors, which means you're invited to make a mess because it's easy to clean up. Um, we have lots of building materials, so love seeing all these Legos all over the place. There's a wall full of bins, and the bins have bellows and springs and cloth and materials you might typically think about prototyping with. There's also like five drawers of different states of Barbies, from the pristine Barbies to the ones that are just Barbie parts. Because if you have an idea, you should be able to pull all these things down and make it real right away and start playing with it. Um, and then I think the other part is emphasizing that play is about process as much as it is about outcome. So don't just show me the really fancy PowerPoint at the end. I want you to show me your whole process. I want to see the messy post-its everywhere as you're trying to make sense of it. I don't want um, people to play together. This is where it actually is great to do like karaoke and do some of these other things because it's in those areas where you can start feeling safe with each other and the vulnerability you can expose when you're in an escape room or if you're like trying to build something with Legos mm -hmm. will come back in spades when you're trying to solve a big problem and you want people to show up with those half-baked ideas that they might not put in front of a crowd they don't feel safe in front of. So play is a great way to create that psychological safety. Right. Um, so yeah, people, process, place. Those are all places to bring play in and yeah. create a better workplace so, culture. So I, I, I love everything you said again. What can I do? But um, I think I have to say, yeah. I have to underscore something that uh, Dr. Lee here has said that is so important. Two letters, AI, okay? November 2022, the world turned upside down with the advent of ChatGPT. What does that mean for our children? It means they need to engage in even more play because play nurtures creativity. And we need our children to be able to do the things that the AI can't do. We need our children to learn to think out of the box and to be creative, and that happens during play. And that's why parents should be interested in anything that their child comes up with. You made an upside down house? Don't say, oh, it's upside down. Say, wow, what a cool idea, it's upside down? You know, you want to follow the child's thinking and that's exactly what takes place in children's museums. You want to help children develop the hunger for going beyond what we know and creating something new. That happens in play. The one piece though is not to put play and AI at odds with each other. And we talked about this a little bit, is like where AI can also be a tool. Like yes. we have designers oh, I'm who totally are playing with AI yes. all the time. Yes. Um, but I think understanding that it's a way for us to diverge and try out different ideas that we can then make sense of and put together right. in new and different ways. Right, so, just like it's yeah. not play versus learning, it's not play versus AI. That's great. Our Tinker Studio over here has concrete floors and bins if you'd like to explore after the panel. <laughs> Um, you can also see all the wonderful things that kids have created together, and you would love, they did a, what is the wheel design called? We were just um, practicing a, a new Tinkerers activity where the kids could use different tools to, to build um, an axle roller ramps, and they had different types of wheels that they could try, but they might fail with those wheels, right? But that's the idea, it's like it. celebrate right. failure, try something new, and see what works, right? Um, so there's, there's a lot of that that we do. And Michelle, I feel like you could apply some of your theories in the US Congress to problem solving. And maybe, maybe you could get a government contract <laughs> and come back and solve all of our problems in this town. It would be wonderful. Work together that. to find solutions. Yes, yeah, um, places for play. Yes, the beauty of play is that anyone can do it though. Resources, materials, they're not always a prerequisite, right? You can play with anything, ketchup packets, mustard packets. We know that kids of lower socioeconomic status are less likely to play, right? Less likely to have someone to play with, to have objects to play with. Um, here at the National Children's Museum, we are a part of Museums for All, a program that is spearheaded by the Association of Children's Museums and IMLS to ensure that all families can enter the museum. And there are hundreds of children's museums around the country that participate in that program as well. Jean Margaret, I know at Nickelodeon you share our commitment to empowering all children through playful experiences. So can you tell us more about this commitment and the role that partnerships have played for you at Nickelodeon to help you achieve that? Um, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think one of the things that we 
one of the reasons why I think there's less play is, I mean, there's 11 million kids in this country who are, you know, suffering from poverty, and it, it's just it's just kind of a, a, a a discordant message, you know, to just tell them to go play. It's it, it when what they're experiencing at home or in their communities is something that we don't want children to experience. Um, and and that I mean honestly, that puts a damper. I mean that I mean that's obviously a crisis in mental health. It's a crisis in just physical health, and these kids. And their family's future are very, it's very difficult. So, you know, it, for us, it, it, knowing that so many children are experiencing this, and so many children are experiencing today hatred, you know, b b because of their religion, the color of their skin, um, because of their gender. Um, because all of this is so heavy and it weighs on kids, part of the opportunity that those of us who work for and with kids when they are outside of their home, whether it's children's museums or I'm involved in the National After School Association um, or Nickelodeon, it, it's our job to be able to deliver a beacon, a message, a support that speaks directly to those kids. So representation is huge. Being welcoming is huge. So when you open your doors um, with Museums for All, it's, it's what's there, who's there, how is that welcoming, how does that happen? It is work that is, that is beyond just the surface, but it, it is just we have to continue on and and you know, it's, it's difficult to talk about because play is supposed to be an antidote, but it's often difficult for it to be an antidote um, when the structures aren't there. But fortunately, folks like all of you here, all of the children's museums, I think children's media, that's, a, that's what we care about, is getting it right so that there is a relevant message there's relevant opportunities, and there are collaborations and partnerships that really open doors and create futures for kids. That's wonderful. Roberta. So I think of children's museums as the last bastion of playful learning in America, <laughs> because a lot of our schools are not playful. And we have research, I'm not gonna go through it, that shows that this is how kids learn best, that when they engage in playful learning, where there is a teacher, I'm not suggesting that you just say, go learn that, no. There's a teacher who thinks hard about the best way to present information or information in the classroom that they can extract themselves from how things are laid out. When there is what we call guided play in the classroom, we know that this is when kids learn the most and when the learning sticks. And I wish, I don't know if this is crazy or not, but I wish that children's museums could offer after school programs routinely for kids. And I wish that they could go out into the community and offer structures like we have done with playful learning landscapes where they bring the museum outside to children who can't necessarily afford to come in. I, I know these are really difficult things when museums are having a difficult time staying alive. But I really want them to be able to do these kinds of things and find donors who will support them in bringing the museum out to the world and out to these 11 million kids who we know are being reared in poverty. And we know, too, from the scientific evidence that poverty is bad for kids. We know that. And we all sink and swim together, although well, Congress does know that. <laughs> and we need to support all our families. Absolutely. Yeah, we, um, you know, we have the privilege of working with our public schools and different community partners here as well. We have a community access program where we provide free admission to families who 
um, who use those different community partners like boys and girls clubs and other after school programs. And it enables us to expand our reach. Um, and then we do programs in the community as well. But I think what I'd love to see is the Department of Education hiring every children's museum in their community to do play-based learning professional development for the teachers. I think um, we can make some real real progress if we, uh, if we take that route. Um, I could talk about, I could ask you all questions all day long, but we have so many amazing people in the room and I wanna make sure we get to their questions. So if I could open it up for some round table dialogue. Julia, Sorry. yes, we have a microphone here. No, you can, we have a microphone and you can ask your question. I was so interested in what you all have said, but especially on this idea of early childhood education, thinking like pre-K to maybe pre-K, K age. Right now we're seeing a lot of students who are starting kindergarten who, and you hear other parents say, well, this one child knows their letters, but this other school just focused on socio, social and emotional development. And then there's a debate, and most parents would assume that it's the kid that knows their letter that is better prepared for first grade mm -hmm. um, or for kindergarten. And I wondered where you stood on that and what the research might show in terms of whether or not children who are, I'm talking like five years old, should be focusing, um, if they should have spent more time focusing on the play and social, social development so um, versus letters. Drill and kill makes kids anxious. That there's research on this. And having a active, playful learning is in no way incompatible with having a strong curriculum. But the problem is that people see these as diametrically opposed. We're going into schools in four cities, courtesy of the Lego Foundation, to put in our active, playful learning program. It is agnostic as to curriculum, it's an approach. And it's a way to help teachers regain the joy that they had from teaching, but which they lost when administrators told them they had to be on page 24 on Tuesday or they would get in trouble. There's too much of that going on. So we want to help schools and children adopt pedagogical ways that will help children learn at the same time that they love to learn and that they're active. So if you get into such a conversation with people, the thing to say, I would think is, these are not incompatible. Children can learn their letters, they can learn to love reading at the same time that they're having a good time. We don't have to tie kids to their seats in kindergarten, what a shame that in schools there are kids who are just doing worksheets all the time, when there are so many fun ways to have them learn. And I'm sure if we had the time, you guys could generate fun ways that kids, for example, could learn the letters of the alphabet, right? Remember spelling bees? Most of us really enjoyed spelling bees, right? There are other crazy things we can do even in kindergarten, even in preschool. Children, children just love learning. Yes, they do. Children love learning. And if you like, tap into that, <laughs> you can get them to learn anything you want them to learn. Mm -hmm. You just have to realize that they are really motivated to learn and to expand and it's just, it's built into them. Yeah, I love that. And I think also when you can combine the two, it's stronger because if you are learning all these fundamentals, but also doing so in a playful environment, chances are you're doing it in context, so you actually understand why you're learning those skills, and you're understanding how to apply them, and you're feeling the agency that you can bring them to new challenges and not just the ones you're presented in a book. Um, I mean, I started my career, my career as an engineer, and I was a really good student because it was all about getting the answer in the back of the book. And it wasn't until I understood design that I was like, it's not gonna serve me to come up with an answer in the back of the book because for the challenges we're facing, the real challenges we need to solve, there is no answer and you have to figure it out. And so um, that's where, that's creativity, where, comes that's where creativity comes yeah. in and some of these other skills, the softer skills yeah. that actually might serve you well in the long run, but you still need the, the fundamentals Absolutely. and know how to marry them in the right way. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? I have a very simple 
almost silly question. Can you define play? What, in your perspective and experience, is play? It's, I know that there's a lot of definitions, and thanks to the power of play from you guys at ACM, I know that you've articulated that. Um, to me, it's, it's like it's joy and pursuing what you want to do um, and, and, and learning and just pursuing that natural curiosity that everybody has because um, we're all unique. And I mean, it's all very different. But that's what, it, to me, that's what play is. And, it's, and it has this little aura of delight around it. Yeah. And make so, yeah. yeah. So that's. But but you know, uh, she raises a great question. You know why? Because even animals play. We are not the only species. Even octopi. <laughs> I can never eat octopus again after seeing my friend octopus. What was that called? My octopus teacher. My octopus teacher. And I the same thing. I can't. I, I can't eat octopus anymore because they play. All kinds of animals engage in play. So it's voluntary and it's oh, yeah. pleasurable, and it often has a social interactional component, but not always, you know, you see kids being super involved in something when there's nobody else around, but kids learn a tremendous amount from interacting with other kids, too. And you never have to say, force a kid to play, right? They may say they're bored, in which case you can provide them with materials and say, make something, have fun, right? The I'm bored thing doesn't cut it. It's because they're not using their imaginations and because they're used to having things supplied to them. So there are ways to encourage kids to engage in this. Play dates often make a big difference. Kids go off on fantasy trips, right? And engage in make-believe play for hours. I have videos of grandchildren, twins. Like 45 minutes they were doing all kinds of make-believe together when they were three. And they were taking on different roles and arguing with each other about who could be what. This is all learning for them. And using language, which is absolutely key, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for language. Yeah, and I'd go to play being a mindset and an approach. It's how we see the world and how we engage with the world and with other people. It is um, a state where we are facing what we're seeing with curiosity and asking questions, as well as experimentation, where we want to get in there and actually try things and engage in a way that's really active. Um, and that's why it feels like it's something that kids naturally do and that adults can bring back if they give themselves permission to do so. Unfortunately, I think we get in our own way in, in playing. Um, and as we get older, for some reason, we feel like we can't, so we stop ourselves from doing that. But it is a natural state. And we can, if we can channel that child and remember what it was like, uh, it can really change our perspective and how we approach things that we tackle as adults and uh, I'll think ultimately get us to better places. And if we can play together, that's even better, because then we're not doing it alone. Sure. That's great. I always say we're in the business of joy, so I love everything that you all have said today. I think museums provide, children's museums in particular, provide the, the unique ability to bring people together, right? Um, adults and children together, children of different ages together. Um, we can be such a great equalizer in that way, um, whether you're a child that's overscheduled because your parents want you to go to Harvard or a child that doesn't have access, right? Um, we're the place where they can come together and play and experiment and, and learn together. So I have absolutely loved this conversation. I'm so grateful that you're all here to be a part of this and to all of you to be uh, to come here tonight and have this dialogue with us. We really appreciate it. This is going to be shared with children's museums, hundreds of them around the country, as well as science and technology centers and other museums. And we hope that we can all together start a play revolution and celebrate this important work that, that you're all doing and that we get to do every day in children's museums. So thank you.